Welcome. My name is Scott Bierman. I'm president of Bloyd College, and it's great to have you join us here on the campus this afternoon. As many in this audience know, I love the history of Beloit. I love reading about it. I love hearing it from the people who know it far better than I do. I love putting its present and future in the context of its past. If you're wondering, as you should, do I mean I love the history of Beloit College or do I love the history of the city of Beloit? The answer is both, unequivocally both. And I love both because you cannot understand one without the other. Unlike nearly any other college town that I know, we share a history. And appropriately, we share a name. The college owes its origins and its existence through uh, collective times with the city, and the city owes a substantial part of its soul and its character to the college. The meaningful intersections that have shaped this town and this college are frequent, meaningful, and deep. But there are a few intersections worthy of a big honking exclamation point. One such intersection is Roy Chapman Andrews, native to the city of Beloit and a graduate of the College of Beloit. He is a distinguished product of both and we share our appreciation of his extraordinary contributions to an understanding of our world. Contributions that continue to be important scientifically, widely recognized and wonderfully inspirational. At this school, we take enormous pride in offering an education that is fundamentally tethered to the liberal arts principles of learning broadly while thinking deeply, but likewise, an education that we expect our students and graduates to put into practice daily in their professional and personal lives. We do so because we believe the Liberal Arts Foundation is a particularly valuable way of organizing yourself, your thinking, and your behavior within a world governed by vast uncertainty and complexity. The Liberal Arts in Practice is a philosophy we embrace, and it is a philosophy personified throughout Roy Chapman Andrews' remarkable life, his life of purposeful consequence that was itself born, developed, and nurtured through his youth in Beloit City and College. In Roy Chapman Andrews' autobiography, titled Under a Lucky Star, he somewhat breathlessly and with unbridled bravado writes about his adventures and accomplishments at the very start of this loving testimony to his own life, he notes, often I have had to sit on a lecture platform when I was going to speak and listen to a long introduction. It bored me stiff, and likewise, the audience. After having read Andrew's autobiography, I suspect he was certain he could tell his story in a far more compelling way than anyone else and was appalled when someone presented his life in anything other than one death-defying moment followed by another. He was probably right, lesson learned. I will, therefore, be uncharacteristically brief. After all, it is Dr. Edie Witter that I came to see as well and to learn from. It is wonderful to have you here with us at Beloit's College and Roy Chapman Andrews College today. Thank you for being here. It is an honor to give up the podium to the president of the Roy Chapman Andrews Society, Carla Swain, who will offer you some further introductions. Carla. Welcome to the Annual Society's Distinguished Explorer Award presentation event with our honored recipient of the Extinguished Explorer Award. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our board members of the Society, 
I'm going to announce your name. Please stand and hold your applause until everyone has been announced. Ann Bossom, Kevin Brown, Lyman Elliott, Deanna Fawn Johnson, Ken Forbeck, Andrew Yonke, Monica Christopa, Martha Mitchell, Lynette Newton, Don Reed, Joe Stottleman, and Jerry Swem, Steve Vavris, Tom Morgan, and Ruth Carlson, our assistant. Thank you. <laughs> Without these precious board members that we have, we wouldn't be able to um, do this presentation this evening. They're all volunteers, and I have a lot of gratitude to all your time and efforts. Thank you. We would also like to recognize all of our members and sponsors that support the Society and the Distinguished Explorer Award that are listed in your program. I do need to note, uh, Best Events was added at the last minute, and Stone Container, we had some last minute um, modifications that we had to make in order to make this presentation. So they pulled through in the last couple of days and were able to fix this up so we can do this appropriately. The Society is pleased to offer these events, including the morning program for area youth at Beloit Memorial High School to promote appreciation of Beloit's hometown hero, Roy Chapman Andrews, and to promote scientific exploration of the sort Roy Chapman pioneered. And now I would like to introduce Ann Bossom, one of the founding members of the Society and Andrews biographer. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Carla. It's uh, my annual pleasure to spend a few minutes at this point in our ceremony talking about the two people who've brought us together today, the man who inspired this award and the individual who is receiving it. We might think that Roy Chapman Andrews and today's honored guest share few points in common. Andrews, after all, gained fame in a region known for, known for its decided lack of water, the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. He regarded water as a surface that had to be crossed en route to fields of exploration a half a world away from home. Our guest today sees water not as an obstacle, but as the portal to a new and almost endless frontier for discovery. You may not know it, but at the beginning of his career, Andrews, too, embraced the possibilities that water offered for exploration. In fact, he spent much of the first six years of it aboard whaling ships and other vessels in his pursuit of the world's largest and, at that time, essentially mysterious aquatic mammals. Were it not for one essential drawback, he might have happily spent his life skimming over the same salty seas that have ensnared the scientist we are honoring today. But Andrews faced a dilemma while afloat the world's oceans. The mammals were irresistible, but walking and rolling was decidedly not. Faced with a career of seasickness and presented with the opportunity to jump ship in Asia, he bailed on whales and set off on alternative trails. Maybe the wide open space of Wisconsin's prairie landscape helped assure the attraction Andrews felt for the Gobi. When he spied it the first time in 1919, he asserted, I have found my country, the one I had been born to know and love. Andrews toggled between America and Asia for the next 13 years, leading a series of five interdisciplinary expeditions in Mongolia that secured his reputation and brought him international acclaim. This fame assured that Andrews crossed paths with the leading explorers of his day. Charles Lindbergh, Richard Byrd, Amelia Earhart, and among many others, a noted ornithologist turned marine scientist named William Beebe. In 1935, Beebe offered his friend the chance to return to the oceans. In fact, he invited Andrews to enter them, in this case wearing a diving helmet with supporting air hose. Beebe's invitation arrived while Andrews served as director of the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, an institution where he had first worked with broom in hand as an, as an assistant in the taxidermy department following his graduation from Beloit College in 1906. Andrews appreciated the honor of directing the museum he had devoted his life to, but desk work couldn't replace exploring, and he leapt at any chance to return to the field, any field, even a wet field. He accepted Beebe's invitation and headed with his second wife for a vacation in the Bahamas. 
His host had already established himself as one of the world's leading experts on the lives of birds when he retooled to pursue an encore career beneath the seas. William Beebe went on to become a pioneer in the exploration of the deep ocean. In 1930, he and his engineering partner set the world record for underwater diving by dropping to the depth of more than 3,000 feet in a pressurized capsule they called a bathysphere. That record stood for 15 years, by the way. Andrews attempted nothing so bold. He merely took up his friend's offer to descend some three dozen feet down a ladder, take a look around, and come back up. As someone who had spent a lifetime stepping into the unknown, Andrews did not hesitate to plunge beneath the waves often on such island. He recorded his experience of, as he called it, dangling in the depths in his memoir, Under a Lucky Star. This is what he wrote. Then I went down. At first, I did not try to look. I was too occupied in staying on the swaying ladder. Near the end, I stopped, clung with one hand, and let my body float off obliquely. I was enveloped in a strange moonlit blue, darkening imperceptibly. Below the same weird blue, I looked up. No water ceiling, no comforting shadow of the boat, only blue and darker blue. The absolute silence was appalling. A few feet away, three great circular jellyfish, ghostly white, floated past. Others rose almost under my swaying body. A single, colorless, pulsing mass hung like a halo above my head. Suddenly, I was afraid. A nameless terror took possession of my bones and flesh and blood. It seemed that I had died and gone to some strange place unknown to human minds. At that point, Andrews experienced what he later described as a sensation of bodily detachment. His brain, he concluded, had ceased to function. Instead, he seemed to begin to hallucinate. Corpses took the places of the jellyfish. Bodies floated past with streaming hair and sightless eyes. So much for new frontiers. Being underwater was proving no less unsettling to Andrews than his earlier experiences floating atop it. The submerged explorer retained the presence of mind to recognize that, quote, the only touch of reality, my only tangible hold on the life I knew, was the rung of that iron ladder. He seized it and pulled himself back to consciousness. Rising to the surface was like waking from a nightmare, he wrote. Yet he had not yet reached shore before I wanted to go down again. Ah, Andrews, ever the intrepid explorer. But alas, all such aspirations ended with his vacation, and this brief experience appears to have served as his only opportunity to plunge into a world that has, in contrast, proven endlessly fascinating to the scientists we are commending today. So that you may learn more about our honored guest, I am delighted to introduce Kevin Brown, Assistant Professor and Chair of the Department of Chemistry at Beloit College. Thank you very much, Anne. I have the distinct privilege of introducing our awardee and telling you a bit about her many accomplishments as an oceanographer, conservationist, and explorer. Jacques Cousteau once said, the best way to observe a fish is to become a fish. Dr. Edith Witter, today's awardee, has done just this through her research. A specialist in bioluminescence, Dr. Witter has been in helping to design and construct new submersibles, instruments, and equipment to enable unobtrusive deep sea observation. Her innovations have produced footage, footage of rare sharks, jellyfish, and crustaceans. They've also revealed illuminated marvels from the deep ocean. In 2004, her research led to the discovery of a new species of large squid, topped in 2012 by the first recordings of the giant squid in its natural habitat. <clears throat> More on this shortly when I turn the podium over to Dr. Witter. Bioluminescence, the biological production of light, takes on many forms in nature. You may recognize bioluminescence as the flicker of fireflies in a warm summer evening. Astute observers may recall the 2008 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, which was awarded for the application of green fluorescent protein, uh, or GFP, in monitoring biological processes. 
Although GFP is not a bioluminescent molecule, its discovery is attributed to research conducted by Dr. Osama Shiomura in the origin of bioluminescence in jellyfish. We may not see it though our perch, uh, from our perch on dry land, but bioluminescence is the main light source in the largest portion of Earth's habitable volume, uh, the deep ocean. As you are about to learn, underwater creatures use it to hunt prey, find mates, and defend against predators. It has been Dr. Witter's goal to better understand this underwater phenomenon. So how does one study bioluminescence in the deep ocean? Dr. Witter followed Cousteau's advice she became a fish. As a certified scientific research pilot for atmospheric diving systems, Dr. Witter is qualified to dive using the deep sea diving suit WASP in the single person untethered submersible deep rover and deep worker. She has also made over 250 dives in the Johnson Sea Link submersibles. Her exploits in operating these craft led her to being named to the Women's Divers Hall of Fame in 2005. In her quest to better understand the use of bioluminescence, Dr. Witter not only became a fish, she has become a very well-traveled fish. Her research has taken her around the world, from the Gulf of Mexico to the coast of Africa to the Pacific and the coast of Japan. Dr. Witter received her bachelor's degree, magnum cum laude, in biology. Tufts University in Medford, Massachusetts. She went on to earn her master's degree in biochemistry <laughs> and a PhD in neurobiology, both from the University of California in Santa Barbara. Upon graduating, she served as a postdoctoral research associate uh, in biology and then as an assistant research biologist and co-principal investigator at UC Santa Barbara. She then joined the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Research Institute, where she rose to the rank of senior scientist. In 2005, in order to help protect the ocean she loves, Dr. Witter co-founded the Ocean Research and Conservation Association, or ORCA, a not-for-profit de dedicated to the study and protection of marine ecosystems and the species they sustain through the development of innovative technology and science-based conservation action. In addition to serving as the president and senior scientist of ORCA, Dr. Witter also holds research positions at the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences, John Hopkins University, the University of Monterey Bay Aquarium, the Florida Institute of Technology, and Florida Atlantic University. Dr. Witter has authored more than 90 peer-reviewed scientific publications and produced numerous educational materials, including the Bioluminescence Coloring Book, uh, which, by the way, will be for sale in the back of the auditorium. <clears throat> Dr. Witter's many honors include being named a MacArthur Fellow by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation in 2006, an Environmentalist of the Year by the Conservation Alliance of St. Lucia County, Florida. Her research has been featured in BBC, PBS, Discovery Channel, and National Geographic television productions through TED Talks and the TED Radio Hour in the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History in Washington, DC. Before we <clears throat> release the Kraken, <laughs> let us formally recognize Dr. Edith Witter, the 2015 recipient of the Distinguished Explorer Award from the Roy Chapman Andrews Society. For the presentation, I call upon Carla Swain, the president of the society, and fellow board member Ann Balsam, uh, who will read the award citation. Dr. Witter, will you please join us uh, on the stage? <laughs> I'm shorter than you, Kevin. Edith A. Witter, biologist, oceanographer, innovator, conservationist, educator. The shimmering surface of our world's oceans presented you with an irresistible porter, portal for exploration. Where others found only darkness, you sought illumination. Where others saw obstacles, you imagined opportunities. Where others hit barriers, you forged partnerships. Through the genius of invention, you plunged into these watery possibilities and found a new world. Orchestrated fireworks, interactive theater, legendary lives. Each lesson learned from exploration fueled the next innovation and pushed the boundaries of discovery. Ever quieter, increasingly savvy, you sparked the burglar alarms of the deep, arousing myth mythical beasts and luring them into the pages and pixels of science. Your countless descents through the Earth's wet wrapper revealed a fantastical world 
but rivaled anything, anything Jules Verne had imagined while traversing all those leagues beneath the sea. Having illuminated this new frontier, you've become its advocate for study, for re reverence, for conservation, helping to inspire citizens of the globe to cherish and preserve the very depths of our planetary home. In appreciation for these contributions, we are pleased to bestow on you the honor of Distinguished Explorer from the Roy Chapman Andrews Society this 20th day of March, 2015, in Beloit, Wisconsin. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's an enormous pleasure to be here for many reasons. First of all, this is a tremendous honor. Roy Chapman Andrews, are, those are just huge footsteps um, to be following in. Uh, he was very big in, in my area of research. He was the first person to study the natural history of whales back when whales were still almost mythical creatures, as Anne said. And, uh, it's also just really fun for me to be here and talk about this. Uh, I spend a lot of time these days talking about pollution, uh, I care deeply about, but this is the fun stuff, and I'm really happy to be able to share it with you today. So I want to give you a little bit of the backstory of how we came to film the giant squid. And to start with, the history of the giant squid. So the first possibly a written description of the giant squid was probably written by Pliny the Elder, um, who was a, an ancient Roman, if you're, and if you're not up in your ancient Romans, um, he was best known um, for his work in natural history, uh, but you might also know him um, because he was apparently the first person to describe hops, which is why there is a beer named after him. <laughs> and uh, but he described this, this strange-sounding creature, uh, the giant squid, that there had been tales of for a very long time. Sailors came back with stories of giant squid that, that supposedly pulled ships and men to their death at sea. And there were descriptions of these things that were so large that they were sometimes mistaken for islands when they were floating at the surface. There was uh, great skepticism within the scientific community given the penchant for sailors to tell tall tales. But uh, the skepticism was finally abated when, in 1861, a French warship working off of the Canary Islands actually came across a carcass. Um, it was actually a, a, a live giant squid, but I think it was probably dying, given the description. And they managed to bring at least a portion of it back to the French Academy, um, where it was shown. and. Undeniably, uh, this phenomenal creature actually really did exist. It was a head-footed creature. It had eight writhing tentacles, two whipping, I mean, eight writhing arms, two whipping tentacles with uh, serrated um, suckers on the end of it, all of this growing out of uh, the body directly. Um, there was a, uh, apparently a jet propulsion system, three hearts that pumped blue blood, an eye as big as a, um, a basketball, and a, a beak like a parrot that could shred flesh. And so this description was given in front of, front of the French Academy in 1861, and in the audience was a gentleman named Jules Verne, who was in the middle of writing a book at the time, a science fiction novel called 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and that description inspired him to include a giant squid in that book, which then further added to the fame of the giant squid. The first image taken of a giant squid was this photograph taken in 1873. This was a, a squid that was brought up in a net off Newfoundland. And there have been a lot of photographs over the years of giant squid that have washed ashore. Um, carcasses have been seen and photographed and actually studied by scientists for a very long time. Uh, 
up until uh, extremely recently, and there have been where giant squid are frequently seen, carcasses or, or tentacles. Uh, there's also places where sperm whales congregate to feed on giant squid. And so this has led a number of um, organizations and groups to come together to form expeditions to go and hunt of the giant squid. Some of you may have seen some of these programs that have been shown on uh, National Geographic and Discovery Channel. Uh, usually ends with the, the chief scientist of the mission sitting on the bow of the ship, a little tear rolling down his cheek uh, as he describes their disappointment in once again not filming the giant squid, squid but being absolutely sure that they would someday. And it, it got to be known as the holy grail of natural history cinematography to actually be able to film a giant squid in its habitat. Uh, one of these expeditions was a, an actually a multinational effort um, with funding from a whole variety of sources, and it took years. It was done over two different years in 1997 and 1999 off New Zealand, um, but also with no success. Now, I am not a giant squid hunter. Uh, I am uh, somebody who's been studying bioluminescence most of my life. So I came into this very late in the game, and to explain how I came into it, a little background on, on my fascinations. And my turning point for my career was when I got to make a series of dives in this strange-looking contraption that was called the WASP. And it's called WASP not because that's an acronym, it's just somebody thought it looked like the insect, uh, which it sort of does with the big yellow body and the bulbous head. And I was very lucky to be included with a group of scientists that were testing this as a tool for ocean exploration. It had actually been developed for use by the offshore oil industry for diving on oil rigs down to 2,000 feet. And so we were going to test it as a tool for ocean exploration. And it was a new concept because there had been so little access. And most of what we knew about the ocean had been um, gathered from net sampling. Um, there had been, you know, some submersible work like William Beebe's, uh, but not a lot. And this was a new approach. Uh, it was an incredible experience in many different ways. It completely changed my understanding of the nature of life in the ocean. It also changed my understanding of the expression colder than a witch's tit. Because that is a metal suit we're talking about here, and the deep sea is actually quite cold. I made dives as long as five hours long. You'll note the wool cap and the wool sweater and the gloves. The wool cap, I, I think it was Jerry Seinfeld that, that uh, talked about 80% of your body heat is lost through your head, so it makes it sound like if you just had the right hat, you could ski naked. A hat helps, but I can tell you, I used to come back from five-hour dives with my teeth chattering and my lips blue, and we had this old oil rig diver in charge of the dives, a uh, really kind of crusty guy named Charlie, and, and one of the, after I came up from one of these dives, he took pity on me, and he pulled me aside, and he put his arm around my shoulder, and he said, look, I'll let you in on a little secret, but you've got to promise not to tell any of these other guys. And I said, sure, Charlie, what is it? Pantyhose which is uh, sort of like silk underwear. It's an extra layer, but I was really never sure which kept me warmer, the pantyhose or the vision in my mind of Charlie wearing pantyhose. <laughs> so my first dive in WASP was in the Santa Barbara Channel, and I went down to a depth of 880 feet. It was actually an evening dive, and I turned out the lights. And the reason I turned out the lights is I knew I would see animals that make light. I didn't discover it. It's been known for a very long time. Ancient sailors were aware of bioluminescence in the ocean. But I was just completely unprepared for what I actually saw, because I saw things like siphonophore chains, a chain of jellyfish longer than this room, pumping out so much light that I could read all the dials and gauges inside the suit without a flashlight. And, and puffs of what looked like blue smoke that would swirl around me and, and blue, um, those are the, the, almost looks like puffs of blue cigarette smoke, um, and then 
blue sparks that would swirl up out of the thrusters, just like when you throw a log on a campfire and embers swirl up off the campfire, only these were icy blue embers. Now, as, as Kevin mentioned, usually if people know about bioluminescence, it's, it's fireflies. And there are a few other land animals that can make light. There's uh, some earthworms and millipedes and centipedes. Um, actually, some fungi make light. But in general, it's pretty rare on land, and so people assume that the same thing is true in the ocean. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. If you go out in the open ocean, almost anywhere in the world, and you drag a net from 3,000 feet to the surface, most of the animals that you bring up in that net make light. Most of the fish, the shrimp, the squid, the jellyfish. And in fact, many places, 80 to 90% of the animals make light. And yet, most people are pretty unaware of bioluminescence. Now, sometimes you do get to see it in surface waters, usually from the stimulation of dinoflagellates. For example, this is a, a dolphin swimming through bioluminescent plankton. And this isn't someplace exotic like one of the bioluminescent bays in Puerto Rico. Uh, this was actually filmed in San Diego Harbor. Uh, and it, you can see some pretty spectacular displays. Unfortunately, that's really not how most people get to see it the first time. Because people have their lights on all the time, even when they're out on the ships at sea. You know the way most people get to see it the first time? A lot of heads on ships, that's toilets for you landlubbers, heads on ships are flushed with unfiltered seawater that have bioluminescent plankton in it. So if you stagger into the head late at night and you're so toilet hugging sick that you forget to turn on the light, you may think you're having a religious experience. <laughs> but if you go deeper, you see a different kind of bioluminescence. And that is what I've seen from submersibles. Um, this is one of the subs that I've done a lot of dives in. And in front of it, I've mounted this screen. It's about three feet across, and it's just got this mesh screen across it. Inside the sphere with me is this intensified camera. And if you turn out the lights, you're going to see a lot of sparkle, but that's not luminescence. That's electronic noise on intensified cameras. But you start to move forward, and animals on the screen are stimulated to bioluminesce and you get to see the bioluminescence. And so these are animals actually in the Gulf of Maine down at around 780 feet. Um, and actually, over the years, I've started to be able to identify animals by the type of luminescent displays they produce. So I can tell you most of the things that are hitting the screen there. A lot of that particulate luminescence that you're seeing is coming from a little comb jelly. Um, and, and it's using it as a kind of defense, just the way a squid or an octopus will release an ink cloud. A lot of these animals will release their bioluminescent chemicals in order to temporarily blind or distract a predator. And we must look like a meteor going through the darkness as, as we light up with all of these particles streaming around the sphere. It's so bright that the pilot and I can see each other by the light of the bioluminescence. But I can tell you that and talk about it, but it still doesn't give you the experience of what bioluminescence really looks like. So I brought along some bioluminescent plankton, and um, they've been good enough to try to darken the room here enough, so I'm hoping that you're going to be ab able to actually see what bioluminescence looks like. So I, I've got a, a bottle here, and we're going to turn the lights out completely, and you'll note that there's no light coming from it right now, which I hope it's not because they're dead. <laughs> um, they've, they've had a rough go of it, but it's possible that they're still alive. And so when I shake this, hopefully it's dark enough in here that you'll be able to see what bioluminescence actually looks like. Oh no, shit. <laughs> Wait a minute, I've got a backup. That's interesting. I don't know why that happened. Well, I do know why that happened. It's called Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong, and if biology is involved, forget about it. Okay, let's try that again. Here we've got a flask. I know this one worked earlier today when I showed it to the kids, but they may be a little tired right now, so we'll try. Okay, shake it up. Whoop, wait a minute. Let's wait till the door closes. Drum roll, please. Okay, here we go. Okay. So I wanted to prove to you that you don't need an intensified camera in order to be able to see that light. 
And all that light you just saw came from dinoflagellates, which are single-celled algae. We can have the lights back up now. Um, and that, that particular dinoflagellate is this one. And the light that you saw comes from little organelles that are sped. Oh. Oops. Oh, this is dangerous. Now I'm going to start telling sea stories. <laughs> you know the only difference between a sea story and a fairy tale? Is a sea story begins once upon a time. I mean, whoops. A fairy tale begins once upon a time, and a sea story begins this ain't no shit. And a fairy tale ends, and they lived happily ever after. And a sea story ends, and everything's been foobar ever since. <laughs> For those of you who don't know foobar, talk to your military friends. They'll explain it to you. There we go. Yeah, OK, Murphy, Murphy had his little fun with us. Now we can move on. So the, the dinoflagellates that I just shook up for you are these guys. Um, this is uh, uh, um, called pyrocystis fusiformis, fire cell, pyrocystis, fusiform shape. And all of that light comes from little organelles spread throughout the cytoplasm. And those, uh, that light is produced by mixing chemicals together. And the chemicals go by the name of luciferin and luciferase. And that came from this experiment that was done by a French physiologist who was curious as to why the clam uh, made light. Now, I do like to explain to students that this is not called a boring clam because it's a boring clam. It's not a dull boring clam. In fact, it's a rock boring clam. Um, but it's a rock boring clam that makes light. And du Raphael Dubois. Uh, wanted to figure out how it made light, so he ground it up with cold water, and he also got a hot water extract, and he found when he mixed those extracts back together again, he could make light. And so he reasoned that the cold water extract might be the enzyme, um, the heat labile uh, substance, and he named it luciferase, after Lucifer, the light bearer, and that the hot water extract was the heat stable substance, or the re uh, um, the substrate, which he named luciferin. And that terminology has stuck, um, but uh, it causes confusion because people think you're talking about specific chemicals. So I had to put this slide in for Kevin. You notice the ha hand pump when, uh, for biochemistry. Um, but you don't have to have had biochemistry to look at these chemicals and realize they're very, very different chemicals. And the point of showing you these is to realize just uh, what an amazing phenomenon bioluminescence must be because it's apparently evolved many different times in evolutionary history, at least 40 separate times, um, maybe as many as 50 separate times. And um, uh, it's a clear in indication of the survival value of the trait when you have that kind of degree of convergent evolution. Now, all of these different chemicals are part of the reason why it's really important to study bioluminescence, because these chemicals extracted from these organisms have been used in a lot of very important assays. For example, the firefly chemistry is used to measure ATP, which is uh, the basic um, energy source for uh, life. And in fact, the firefly assay was used on Mars to test for the presence of life. Um, and as Kevin mentioned, uh, this gentleman, Osama Shimomura, won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2008 for the work that he did on this bioluminescent jellyfish, um, where he was trying, just like Raphael Dubois, to figure out how this animal made light. And he discovered that the luciferin, the aquarin, as it was called, um, that then passed its uh, light to a green fluorescent protein. And that green fluorescent protein has been equated to the invention of the microscope in terms of the impact that it's had on science. That's why he won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. It's allowed us to illuminate the inner workings of cells, to be attached to DNA, to figure out any time DNA is turned on. It's had more to do with our advancements in uh, molecular genetics than any other discovery made. Uh, and it, you, 
there's not enough you can say about it in terms of the impact it's had. Now, it's not just the chemicals that are useful, but it's actually the organisms themselves. For example, some of the critters that make light are bioluminescent bacteria, and unlike the dinoflagellates that I shook up for you that flash, or the fireflies that flash, bacteria are interesting because they glow all the time. And that turns out to be very useful for a number of reasons. For example, in my organization, um, where we are trying to develop new ways to track pollution, we're using the fact that, that um, the bacteria glow as an assay for toxicity. So the cool thing about bioluminescent bacteria is their light output is linked to their respiratory chain, basically their breathing. So any toxicant that interferes with that, interferes with respiration, interferes with light output. So if you bring back sediment that you want to know if it's toxic or not, um, you can mix a little bacteria into it and see how much the light is quenched. And if the light goes out, you've got a really toxic substance. So you don't know what the toxicant is, but you know that this spot is more toxic than this spot. So we're able to start working to create pollution maps um, that look like this, where you can figure out where your hot spots are and then focus your efforts on um, analyzing what the source of the pollutant is. In this particular case, it happened to be mercury, um, but uh, it's been different in different places. One cool thing about this bioluminescent bacterial assay um, is it's very simple to do, and so we've been able to get high school students involved with us. And so they've been going out with us in the field to create these pollution maps, and it allows us then to get um, the community involved in dealing with this huge problem that we have and are still ignoring of chemical pollution in our environment. So bioluminescence is very useful to humans for a, a variety of different reasons, but it's very, very useful to the animals, and that's why it's evolved so many different times. For example, this fish has a built-in flashlight that it can use to help find its prey. Um, Strange-looking fish with this weird jaw structure. Uh, that's the bottom of the mouth. That's a ligament kind of like an elastic band that holds the bottom of the mouth. Those are the gills. But this weird jaw can unhinge to open out this far to be able to swallow things bigger than itself. This fish has built-in high beams. This fish, which is one of my favorites, um, has three different light organs on each side of the head. Uh, and they're different colors, which is phenomenal. And so this one is blue, which it kind of uses as high beams, but these are red, and red is a really unusual color. If you've opened your eyes underwater, everything looks blue, and that's because seawater is a very good filter. It filters out all the reds, the yellows, and oranges. Blue travels the furthest. That's what the color is that most animals emit, and that's what the color is that most animals can see. This fish is unusual in that not only does it emit red light, it can see red light, and so it uses its red light as a sniper scope to be able to sneak up on animals that are blind to red light, it can see them without them seeing uh, it. It also has a little chin barbel here with a glowing lure on it that it can use to attract food. And there's a lot of animals out there that use luminescent lures. Uh, you may be familiar with this one, the anglerfish. Um, I was so happy when Pixar actually included bioluminescence in one of their um, million dollar, multi-million dollar, billion dollar productions. I don't know what they cost these days. Uh, but I do wish, given their budget, they might have spent just a tiny bit more to maybe pay a graduate student as a consultant that could have told them that those are the eyes of a fish that has been preserved in formalin. These are the eyes of a living anglerfish. And she's got this lovely little lure that she uses to attract unsuspecting uh, shrimp and fish that come nibble on it and find themselves engulfed in this living mousetrap of needle-sharp teeth. This lovely lady has a lure that has all these interesting threads coming off it. And we used to think that the different shape of lure was how um, uh, they attracted different types of prey. But when we've looked at what these fish eat, we find they all eat pretty much the same thing. So now we believe the shape of the lure is how the male finds the female of his species. Because the male in the anglerfish world is a, a strange creature. He's what's known as a dwarf male. This little guy has no visible means of self-support. 
He has no lure for attracting food and actually no teeth for eating it, even if he could attract it. His only hope for existence on this planet is as a gigolo. <laughs> he's got to find himself a babe, and then he's got to latch on for life. So this little guy has found himself this babe, and yes, he has had the good sense to attach himself in a way that he doesn't actually have to look at her. <laughs> but he still knows a good thing when he sees it, and he has sealed it with an eternal kiss. And so his flesh fuses with her flesh, her bloodstream grows into his body, and he becomes nothing more than a little sperm sack. I'm not going to take it any further than that. <laughs> Another way bioluminescence gets used is, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of animals can release their bioluminescent chemicals just as this shrimp is doing. It's spewing bioluminescence out of its mouth like a fire-breathing dragon in order to temporarily blind this viper fish that's about to attack it, uh, allowing it to escape into the darkness. And there's a lot of animals that use this trick. This fish actually has a tube on its shoulder that it can, can squirt light out of, and it's called the shining tube shoulder. And I was actually lucky enough to capture one of these fish. Um, I was a consultant on the deep portion of the Blue Planet series that BBC made, and we were trawling off the northwest coast of Africa with a very special net that allowed us to bring these animals up alive in many cases. And so I caught one of these fish and brought it into the lab on the ship, and when I did so, that's me holding it, and I'm about to touch that tube on its shoulder. And when I do, you're going to see it squirt out an astonishing amount of light. But to me as a biologist, the really astonishing thing is it's not just squirting out luciferin and luciferates. It's actually squirting out whole cells. And uh, that's energetically very costly. Nuclei, you know, all of those internal membranes and mitochondria. Um, so... Why it does that, we have no idea, um, but it's a great mystery that somebody needs to solve someday. Um, another way that animals will use their bioluminescence is something called a bioluminescent burglar alarm. And the idea is that if you're caught in the clutches of a predator, your only hope for escape may be to attract the attention of a larger predator. So here we have a deep sea fish that's got a flashlight. Um, it's also got a, a a lure that it can use to attract food. It's also got light organs all along its belly that it uses for a type of camouflage. But if it's caught, it uses all of those light organs at once. Now, usually we never get to see this because if we bring these animals up in nets, they've exhausted their luminescence, and you, you don't actually get to see it. Um, but this fish we actually caught from a submersible. Turned out the top speed of this fish was one knot, which was the top speed of the submersible. So we had to chase it for quite a long time, but it was worth it. We caught it in one of the special capture devices on the sub. I brought it up into the lab. Everything on this fish lights up. Everything. It's incredible. You're seeing the, the flashlights lighting up. The chin barbel is lighting up. <clears throat> the belly lights. Even the fins lit up. We didn't know the fins could light up. There's the, the chin barbel. And it's just this incredible scream for help meant to attract the attention of something bigger that will come and attack whatever is attacking it, which in this case was me. I was holding it by the tail. Um, there's a, a jellyfish that can do this. Um, this jellyfish produces an amazing pinwheel display of light. And so <clears throat> uh, this is important to the giant squid part of the story. So. Uh, when I was trying to explain this to people, they weren't getting it, so I, was, I resorted to some really crude art, which I apologize for in advance. Um, but <clears throat> this is a jellyfish minding its own business in the dark depths of the sea. Some fish stumbles on it and starts munching on it. Well, it goes into its pinwheel display, but in doing so, it illuminates the fish and makes the fish visible to its predators. And so... The larger predator isn't attacking the jellyfish. It isn't the giant squid-like jellyfish. Giant squid are coming in to attack whatever is attacking the jellyfish. At least that was my theory. Well, when I first developed this idea that maybe the, this could actually be used as a lure, I had a really hard time getting it funded because in science, funding is limited um, and you really have to tell the funding agencies what you're going to discover before they'll give you the money. 
And my point was I thought that we had been scaring a lot of animals away and that we needed to have different ways of attracting animals. And so I couldn't tell them what I was going to discover. That was kind of the point. And so I had to put this idea together from very limited funding sources. Um, and you can see that in this first optical lure that we developed. Um, these are the 16 blue lights that we put in, uh, and we sealed them in epoxy. But you can still see the word Ziploc um, in the, the mold that we used for the epoxy. I still think I ought to be able to get some kind of corporate sponsorship for that. But I, I guess there's not really a big call for Ziplocs on the bottom of the ocean. Um, so if I was going to do this and, and test this uh, optical um, electronic jellyfish, then I needed to be able to put it in the ocean and observe it in a way that I wasn't going to disturb it or disturb the animals that were um, coming in on it. Now, when you want to do this on land, um, we, when we want to observe nocturnal animals without disturbing them with our lights, we use infrared cameras and infrared light, um, which works great. But unfortunately, in the ocean, as I mentioned, red light is absorbed very quickly. Infrared light virtually disappears. So this was a big problem. Now, I, I wanted to put in a little side story here in honor of Roy Chapman Andrews, um, because sometimes science gets done for unusual reasons. I'd had this idea in the back of my mind for some time, um, and I had gotten the opportunity um, I'd been given the tremendous of being made uh, an adjunct at um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And that was particularly sweet because it came with an opportunity to use their equipment, their ships and um, remote operated vehicles. And the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute was started by um, David Packard of Hewlett Packard fame. And he had this uh, marvelous idea of a new kind of oceanography. So he built uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, which is known as Mbari, at the head of the Monterey Canyon, which is an incredibly deep canyon, with the idea that, that the scientists could go out on the ship and get to deep water in very short time, operate offshore, and then um, come ashore at night and you know sleep ashore like normal human beings. And when I first heard about this, I thought, what a brilliant idea. What a great idea. It turns out that it's not such a great idea. So I had been going to sea for 18 years without ever getting seasick. Then I started to use the um, Embari ship, the Point Lobos. Now the Point Lobos is known as a vomit comet. <laughs> and it comes by that name legitimately. Um, it does not ride the seas well. It, the ROV control booth is up in the bow of the ship, and so you're sitting up in the bow, which is you know just pounding up and down, and you've got these screens that you're looking at right in front of you. It's a bad formula for, for to begin with. But what I hadn't realized is 18 years of not being seasick was because it usually takes a day to get on site. And I was getting my sea legs. I wasn't really aware of it, but I was getting my sea legs. Well, the Point Lobos could get out to sight in very short order. Um, and so I wasn't getting my sea legs. On top of that, because I was working on bioluminescence at, when I first started using their equipment, um, I was working at night. So I would fly out from the East Coast and get there jet lagged and then stay up all night. Um, so it was bad in that sense. Also, I was making no friends with the, sub -crew, the ROV pilots and, the, and the, uh, the crew of the ship because nobody liked doing night duty. So I started to think, well, okay, <clears throat> what could I do <clears throat> with these wonderful tools, um, but not bioluminescence related because I needed to be at, it needed to be at night if I was going to do the bioluminescence work I wanted to do. So uh, I, had the, I was, had the ROV set up um, for uh, that kind of splat screen um, thing I showed you earlier, um, and it had an intensified camera. So I wondered, you know, would the intensified camera help make up for it if I started to try to mess around with using red lights? Other people had tried to use red light to observe animals in the ocean. They couldn't do it because you couldn't see anything. The red light just was disappeared too quickly. But I was hoping the intensified cameras that I use for bioluminescence might help com uh, compensate. So I put red filters on the lights, and uh, started putting bait 
boxes down there. And sure enough, I could see really well with the red light. And I started watching how sable fish would come into a bait box. And I could plot, if they were under red light, um, I'd see a whole lot of fish. As soon as I turned the white lights on, the fish would disappear, red lights on. I could make them dance in and out. Um, so red light was a really good thing. So, okay, I had an illumination system. Um, then I needed to uh, figure out how I was going to do this because I didn't want to do it from an ROV or submersible because I was pretty sure that those were scaring animals away. I'd spent a lot of my career working um, with this submersible and these two remote operated vehicles owned by Embari. And uh, I had the impression that I saw a lot more animals when I was using this platform, the submersible, than when I was using either of these two. And I also felt like I saw more with this than this. And I thought it might have something to do with the amount of noise they made. So I put a hydrophone on the bottom of the ocean and listened to how noisy they were. And you can barely hear that. I don't know if you can hear it at all. But that's the electrical sounds of the Johnson Sea Link, which might explain why I did see a lot of animals working with the Johnson Sea Link on the bottom of the ocean. The Tiburon is also electric. It's a bit noisier. Um, but still not too bad. But most of the remote operated vehicles these days are hydraulically powered, and hydraulic motors are much louder than electric motors. Uh, almost all of the ROVs now have converted to this. I gotta believe that that's scaring a lot of animals away. So I came up with a camera system that we could put on the bottom of the ocean. We called it the eye in the sea. And we started testing it. And we would put down um, a bait bag. And we had a pretty crummy camera, which is all we could afford, because we were still kludging this together. Now in this case, it didn't seem like there was any reaction to the light. As soon as this video starts is the moment that the red light comes on. In this case, a couple sable fish, they seem to kind of turn away from the light. And they're not exactly startled by it, but be hard to say for sure, but in this case, there's this delay when the light comes on and then everybody scatters. That's clearly a reaction to the red light. And this one is the most common thing you'd see is the sable fish would kind of come in at the edge of the light and then turn away from it. And so that's not what I wanted. I wanted to be able to see without being seen. But I tried. the, the I was using um, red LEDs, and, and the longer wavelength I, I went, um, the less I could see, but it seemed like the animals were still reacting to it. But see without being seen, well, I knew that these red, lights, red stoplight fish, like the one I showed you earlier, could do that. So how do they do it? Well, it turns out they have a filter over that red light organ. Um, and so if you peel that filter off, it turns out it's got a very broad emission spectrum. But with the filter in place, it's got a cutoff. And so you can see with the light in the longer wavelengths, but not extending down into the shorter wavelengths. And so that's what I did. I used that fish for inspiration and used a 680 nanometer you know, far red light LED, but put a, a sharp cutoff filter in front of it. And then I could see without being seen. And the first time I really got to test this on an expedition was in the Gulf of Mexico. And we put it down next to an oasis of, on the bottom of the ocean, someplace I thought large predators might patrol. And um, it's hard to see this, but there's a fish there swimming towards the light. And uh, I was thrilled because I felt like I had my window into the deep sea and I had about four hours of data like this. So you deploy the camera and then you recover it to see what it's recorded. But four hours into the deployment, I had programmed chronic jellyfish to come on for the first time. 86 seconds after we turned that electronic lure on for the first time, we recorded this. Oh, good. Murphy is just having a field day with me. We recorded a squid over six feet long that is so new to science it could not be placed in any known scientific family. I'll come back to it later if I have time um, and show you what it looked like. But I have some others that, that'll, that'll give the same effect. So uh, I went back to the National Science Foundation, and I said, this is what we will discover. 
and they gave me a half a million dollars to do it right. <laughs> so doing it right involved the world's first deep sea webcam. And uh, we installed this in Monterey Canyon, and it was out there for eight months. And we had an electronic jellyfish on it. And fortunately, that's working. And that's a Humboldt squid um, attacking the electronic jellyfish. And we saw this a lot. Uh, now, in this case, the squid's going to come in and attack. And then Ink, apparently pissed off that there was no dinner there. And then we have this next guy who's kind of the Einstein of squid, because he recognizes immediately that this isn't right. There's supposed to be something there. And he's not going to be fooled. But he's also not going to give up easily, because he just keeps coming back, because he knows there's a Big Mac there somewhere. There's dinner that's causing that, that light show. And he goes away, and he thinks about it for a while, and he thinks, well, maybe if I come in from a different angle? <laughs> nope. So it was around this time that I came up with a new version of the Eye in the Sea, which was this platform, um, a do different version of the electronic jellyfish. It's a much smaller package. It didn't need to be deployed from a submersible or remote-operated vehicle. And so I was looking for an opportunity to test this at sea. Around that same time, <clears throat> in, it was 2010, I gave a TED Talk, my first TED Talk. And it was uh, an unusual um, TED because it was held at sea in the Galapagos Islands. Um, and uh, one of the other people on that mission was Mike Degree. And Mike Degree was a giant squid hunter. And he got, I was talking about a new way to explore the deep sea, one that didn't scare the animals away, one that focused on attracting them instead. And he got really excited, as Mike tended to do about everything, and, and um, said, you know, well, would this work for the giant squid? And I said, yeah, I thought possibly it would. Well, the reason he was asking was he was already involved in uh, the spin-up of a new giant squid expedition. And this had been put together because Dr. Sunimi Kubadera of Japan uh, also in, I think it was, it was in 2004, um, he had been hunting for the giant squid in his own way, and he had been putting cameras down in the ocean with bait, and he'd done it for two years without success, and then he got these first images, first still images of a giant squid um, in the deep sea. And Dr. Kubadera is just the sweetest, gentlest man you'd ever want to meet. He's so unassuming, and he was completely unprepared for the incredible response that this engendered. I mean, the, worldwide, the public went crazy. There's apparently a lot of giant squid nuts out there. I can attest to this personally now. Um, they've been sending me pictures of their tattoos and all kinds of other things. Um, they're a very dedicated bunch. Uh, Anyway, that response, Kubadera's success and that response um, led the uh, Japanese Broadcasting Corporation, known as NHK, to put a lot of money into the development of an expedition to go back to the same place off of Japan where Kubadera had gotten his original images. Um, and uh, they also got uh, Discovery Channel involved in it to help defray some of the costs. And so Mike had been talking to Discovery Channel about this. And so he went back and told them about my new method. And they invited me to something that they called the Squid Summit, where they had giant squid explorers from all over the world uh, and me. And I talked about doing this differently. And I, you know, it took a little bit of convincing. But when I showed them the video that I just showed you, they got pretty convinced pretty fast. And so I convinced them that you know we shouldn't use white to use red light, we needed to use super intensified cameras, and we needed to use lures. So um, at that juncture, now I was invited to come on the mission. Now, I've been involved in a lot of expeditions where television has been involved in some way or another. Usually, I'm the chief scientist, and I'm allowing a film crew to come along and film what we're doing. There was once before that I was involved in a 
TV-funded expedition where it was Discovery Channel. We were the first oceanographic uh, vessel allowed into Cuban waters. And uh, I had a blast. I had a really great time, but I got no science done because they were always interested in just getting the right shot and then moving on, and you couldn't do any science. So at the time, I said I would never do a, a television-funded expedition again. But that was before all of the funding for deep sea research had started to be slashed. And I really wanted to test my new camera system, and they were offering me six weeks at sea. And so I said, OK, but with a lot of trepidation. Um, and part of the reason is, uh, well, one of my favorite Florida authors, Carl Hyacin, described the f experience of selling his first book to Hollywood as being like dropping your kids off at the Charlie Manson daycare center. <laughs> and putting one's science in the hands of Hollywood and television has very much the same feel. And I could tell you many stories about this, but I'll just give you one example which is the title that they came up with for, for, the expedi for the documentary. As scientists, we were horrified by this title. Well, first of all, of course it's real. We've been studying carcasses for over 100 years. And secondly, we don't think of it as a monster. And so Discovery's version of a compromise was to change the title from Giant Squid, the Monster is Real, to Monster Squid, the Giant is Real. <laughs> I wish I were kidding, but I'm not. Um, on the premise that monster could refer to its size instead of its morals. So this was unlike any expedition I've ever been involved in. Usually, you write a proposal to the National Science Foundation or to the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, and you go out on a government-owned or a university-owned ship, um, which, you know, they're, they're nice ships, but but they're just the basics. Well, this was different because uh, NHK rented this luxury yacht that was owned by uh, this gentleman, Ray Dalio, um, who is, I believe, the 44th richest man in the United States. Ray Dalio owns more submersibles than any oceanographic institution in the world. He owns four for his own personal pleasure. Uh, the vessel, the Aleutia, uh, was not like anything I've ever been on for an expedition. Um, that's me working hard, as you see there. Um, you know, this is the lounge where we would have our meetings. These are the accommodations, which, as you can see, yeah, extremely rough. Uh, you know, office space. I mean, this was so ridiculous. They even had white carpets on the floor. And actually, those aren't the original white carpet, carpets. The, he had special carpets made to put over the real white carpets because he knew we would make them dirty. But he made them white carpets. And so <laughs> we had everywhere there were at the doors, it said absolutely no, no shoes beyond this point. So we were all supposed to be running around barefoot, which was fine. But when you come in from working on the deck, these bins of shoes. And then you'd get the call that the sub was on deck, and, and everybody would be rushing out and pawing through these baskets, trying to find your shoes, got absolutely ridiculous. So everybody's out on the fantail in flip-flops or bare feet uh, and hard hats. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't an OSHA-run vessel, so it didn't matter. And in fact, it really wasn't. So uh, we had gourmet food on the sun deck. Um, and because it wasn't a government-owned vessel, we could have liquor. Uh, <laughs> it was pretty amazing. And then there were the submersibles. So he had three on this particular expedition, the Triton, um, the Deep Rover, and the Double Deep Worker. And we were using primarily the Triton and the Deep Rover. And it's on a railroad track. There's a, a cart here and a railroad track. So we could roll it out of this high bay. Um, and right behind it is the Deep Rover. Um, so they're just, you know, right behind each other. And you roll it out to the end and launch it off the fantail. Now, one of my real trepidations about going on this expedition is I've actually had um, experience with what are called ships of opportunity, 
where um, you use a ship that isn't actually designed to launch a submersible, and that's what you're seeing here. Um, you know, it's just on a, a rope um, with these ropes, and it's extremely dangerous because, it, you know, in a high sea state, it can, it can swing around like a, a very heavy pendulum and, and uh, a lot of damage can be done. What I didn't count on was because it's Ray Dalio's luxury yacht, it has the most active ballasting system I've ever seen. And so even in a pretty high sea state, that ship was pretty rock solid in the water. So it, in every way, this was an unexpected uh, expedition. And so I was able to use my um, new toy, this new um, camera platform, and we went to the uh, Ogasawara Islands, um, which are just south of Japan, and it's a, a, a feeding ground for sperm whales that feed on giant squid, so that was part of the reason we were there, plus this is where Kubadera had filmed um, the giant squid, or gotten the first still images of the giant squid. And so the idea was, you know, this is my, my new um, electronic jellyfish, and um, you just attach it out in front of the, the camera platform. Um, this is the camera. Those are the red lights uh, that are um, illuminating the field of view. And uh, uh, you could just throw this thing off the back of the ship. Uh, no submersible or remote operated vehicle needed. It had 700 meters of line attached to it. and that line was attached to a float at the surface that had a satellite beacon on it. So we could throw it out there and just leave it out for a couple of days. And all the time it was out there, it was filming. Um, and it was using a uh, red light to see with and this blue light that was imitating the bioluminescence of this wonderful deep sea jellyfish that was my original inspiration for this optical lure. This is what the actual burglar alarm display of that jellyfish looks like. And this is the display of the electronic jellyfish, which was a pretty good imitation of it. So, you know, I was hopeful, not necessarily that we'd maybe see a giant squid, but we'd certainly see something that nobody had ever seen before, because we've explored so little of the ocean, it's pretty much a sure bet. So I was a little dismayed when, when we recovered the camera system the first time and we were reviewing all of that data, hours and hours of data, and we saw nothing. I mean, literally nothing. It was one of the most barren places I've ever been in. And yet they had this magic map, which they had been putting together for years, of all the sightings of sperm whales with giant squid tentacles hanging out of their mouth or uh, giant squid carcasses. They were sure that giant squid could, could be there. So uh, on the second deployment of my camera system um, is when we got our first sighting. And usually you don't get to share this moment of discovery, which is why we all become explorers with people. But because it was a television-funded expedition, they had cameras rolling all the time. So they actually caught the moment when we saw it. So we're just going through this data. Um, and this is what it looked like, generally. And then this came into the field of view. <laughs> that still gives me chills. Bunch of scientists getting very, very excited. So, uh, you know, we did more deployments, and we saw it several times, but each time it was like this. It would just kind of wave its arms in front of the camera and not show itself. And it was <laughs> kind of like it was doing a fan dance. And, and then we saw this. I just love that shot, and I, I love the fact that it, it comes up over the electronic jellyfish, ignoring it completely, and attacking the enormous thing next to it, which is exactly what you'd expect it to do if it was uh, a burglar alarm. So uh, that was glorious enough, um, but we were also diving the submersible, the Triton, every day, and we take turns going down in it for eight hours at a stretch. and. Uh, when I went down, I'd go down with the electronic jellyfish and cameras with the red lights. Um, when uh, Steve 
Gown, who was um, one of the other scientists, he was using a chemical lure, and I don't think he was using the red lights very much. He wasn't convinced that that was the way to go. Um, and then Kubadera was using a bait squid. And uh, he, um, after my success with my camera system, started attaching a light to uh, So that's the Triton, and this is the diamondback bait squid that he was using. Uh, and it's got this flashing light attached to it that is, uh, you know, similar to my optical lure. And uh, now initially what you're going to see here um, is the flashing light, and there's the bait squid. And this is under red light with the intensified camera, so you're not going to see it very well. But the giant comes in and attacks from behind right there. And, uh, and then Kubadera got so excited he turned on his white flashlight to be able to try to see it a little better. But by that time, the giant was munching on its dinner and apparently was undeterred, so Ku decided it was safe to turn on the white lights from the sub. And sure enough, the giant stayed. And it was phenomenal. It actually stayed for 23 minutes. And so we actually got to observe it for a very extended period of time, the longest obviously anybody's ever observed a giant squid in its natural habitat. And it was so different than we thought it would look because all of us, when we've seen dead specimens of giant squid, they've been reddish in color, but this is bronze. It looks like it's carved out of metal. And, and it um, uh, would sometimes turn to silver. And look at that enormous eye, incredible eye the size of a basketball. And, and the, um, the jet propulsion system there and these, you know, these lashing arms, just absolutely incredible. And the amazing thing is that we really believe that there actually may be millions of giant squid in the ocean based on the number of squid beaks that have been found in the bellies of sperm whales. And yet we'd never seen one before, even though we'd been looking for them. But we've only explored about 5% of our ocean. And I maintain that we've been doing it wrong. We've been scaring the animals away. So I think it's really important to get across, especially to kids, that there is plenty left to explore out there. Become explorers. It is absolutely the most thrilling experience you can ever have. And there is lots left to explore. Thank you. Thank you very much. Be happy to answer any questions. Uh, hi, my name is Tara. Um, uh, I was just wondering when you decided that this was something that you wanted to do. Like, what what stage of your life did you decide that marine biology or? Um, I was age 11 when I decided I wanted to be a marine biologist. I, I, was, I told the kids today at, at the high school um, this story, but the, when I was 11, my parents, um, <clears throat> who were both math mathematicians, it was a sabbatical year, and we traveled around the world. And we went to Europe and visited all these wonderful art museums, and I decided I wanted to be an artist. And then we went to Egypt, and I got to explore the pyramids and, and the tombs and decided I wanted to be an archaeologist. And then we went to India, and I saw great poverty and decided I wanted to become a humanitarian like Albert Schweitzer. And then we spent six months in Australia, and I got to uh, climb trees after koalas and track wallabies and hold a wombat, and I decided I wanted to be a biologist. And our last stop was Fiji, and I got to explore a coral reef, and I decided I wanted to be a marine biologist. So the family joke was, had we traveled from west to east instead of east to west, would I have ended up an artist? Um, <laughs> But I think the marine biology stuck because it, it just enthralled me, and it stuck with me. And even in high school, in my high school yearbook, it said, you know, I wanted to be a marine biologist. Uh, 
Um, hi. Does it work? Murphy again? No, technology. Technology hates me. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, I, I'm Marin. Um, Kevin Smith is your. Um, I was wondering if you know the genotype, like, of, not the genotype, the, the DNA when the anglerfish male attaches to the female, when the cells are replenished, are they carrying the male DNA or the female DNA? I, I missed a. a who is who carrying the male or female DNA? Oh, the the sac. <laughs> the sac is the female. Like, is the DNA of the cells of the sac? Are they incorporated into the female's DNA, or is it still the male anglerfish producing cells being the sac? I don't know that that's actually known. That's a, that's just an extremely good question. My future. There you go. There's, there's a, a young a young explorer over there. Let's see if this works. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have said that. So had that giant squid had its tentacles, its feeding tentacles intact and fully extended, it would have been as tall as a two-story house. And, and uh, they, they can get as tall as a four-story house. We have an, another young investigator up there. Can you shout out your question? Uh, they, they can tell, um, uh, that's, a, that's a super, as I said, I'm not a giant squid hunter. Uh, well, one of the ways you can tell is that the, um, the males will often inject a, uh, a packet of sperm into the female, and so the female arms, you sometimes find these packets of sperm in them, so, so you know this is a female and it came from a male. Um, but uh, uh, beyond that, I'd have to actually, uh, I think it's actually pretty hard, if I remember correctly. Um, there's not any obvious difference between the males and the females. Uh, you, you know, you have to um, dissect them to be able to figure out which is which. Yes? How many oceans have I explored? Well, I've explored quite a bit of the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Pacific. But I'd like to do more. Oh no, I mean there's, there's, there's lots of these where the, the male and female are the same. Um, there, you know, but, but most of the time, uh, that's a good, good comment. Let's see, do I know any bioluminescent examples of um, hermaphrodites? Uh, I'm not thinking of any right now. I can't think of any bioluminescence examples, but there's, there's plenty of uh, marine hermaphrodites out there. Um, it, it, uh, it, it's pretty common. Yeah. I think it is working. Oh, there you go. Um, how are you continuing, or what are you doing next? What's your next research with this? Or Well, actually, I, I have an expedition this summer in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and uh, we, it's a continuation of a study we started in the Bahamas a couple years ago, where we're looking at benthic bioluminescence, the animals that live on the bottom of the ocean. Um, we know quite a bit about the animals that live in the midwater, but very, very little about uh, animals on the bottom. And there's this kind of weird phenomenon of uh, eye size, um, where there's, there's animals with very large eyes that live on the bottom, and we've always assumed it has something to do with bioluminescence, but when you look, there, doesn't seem to be a, there don't seem to be a lot of bioluminescent animals living on the bottom. So we're going to be exploring um, in the Gulf of Mexico to try to find other organisms that uh, produce light that, that hadn't been known to be luminescent before. 
But most of what I do right now is actually uh, focus on um, conservation and, and uh, developing technologies to track pollution. Because, uh, you know, I, I feel like we're destroying the ocean before we even know what's in it. And so I really want to try to give back to the ocean I love in any way I can. And since a lot of what I've done in my career is work with engineers to solve technological problems, that's what I'm trying to do now for the ocean. I think I want to ask. Okay. Uh, he was hoping that we could look at the uh, dinoplankton or whatever it was that you had that had bioluminescence again yep. a little closer. We, if you uh, want to let other people ask questions first, that's fine. Okay. Thanks. Being in a freshwater state, are there many examples of bioluminescence in freshwater bodies like the Great Lakes? Actually, there aren't. Um, and uh, <clears throat> there's actually only one known species of freshwater organism because biology needs an exception to every rule. Um, and it's in the northern streams of New Zealand. It's a freshwater limpet that it, uh, it uses its bioluminescence for defense. Um, <clears throat> we think the reason is that uh, the evolution of bioluminescence was driven by the open ocean environment where there's no hiding places, there's no trees or bushes to hide behind. And so as the ocean filled up with ever swifter and nastier predators, a lot of animals that had already evolved eyes were forced into the dark depths to hide. And so the evolutionary selection pressure was on developing more sensitive eyes and more uh, um, enhanced signaling capabilities. And so that's where bioluminescence came in. So that's why you see so much of it in the open ocean environment. But as you move into the coastal zone, there isn't nearly as much, um, and not as much in the benthic zone either, because there are hiding places down there. And as animals moved out onto land, most of those you know, weren't luminescent. Now, <clears throat> there's some thought that there ought to be bioluminescence in some place like, some place like Lake Baikal, which is uh, you know, the deepest lake in the world. Um, and there's been some reports, but never anything confirmed. Um, but it's, it's possible that there's luminescence in freshwater environments. Not many people have looked. <clears throat> I was just wondering if the uh, development of autonomous or robotic research tools would help your r research at all? Um, well, uh, I'm not a big fan of remote operated vehicles because I think, you know, right now they're hydraulically powered and so I think they're scaring the animals away. Um, I know Bob Ballard was one of the honorees here, but I've got kind of a, a feud going with Bob Ballard because, <laughs> because he has dismissed submersibles as being too dangerous and that you can do anything with a remote operated ve vehicle that you could do with a submersible, and I disagree. You can't. And, you know, submersibles are far less obtrusive. They're far better exploration tools. If he wants to use ROVs, that's fine, but he shouldn't try to stop the rest of us from using them. <sighs> Yeah. Um, as you may know, um, NASA has given preliminary approval to a mission to Europa, which is one of the moons of Jupiter, okay. which is almost all water ice with a rocky core and has a possible subsurface salty ocean. And I was wondering if they've contacted you with respect to looking into life in that subsurface ocean. Not yet, but if you, if you know anybody, please suggest it. <laughs> I think there's somebody in the back up here. Can you shout out your question? Is there any uh, bioluminescence bio 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 that you made some of the mice that you missed from humans, like the ultraviolet or, or uh, Yeah, what a good question. Actually, there is. Most of it is in the visible range, obviously. And it comes in all colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. Most of it in the open ocean is blue. And most of it in the coastal zone is green because um, those are the colors that transmit best through it. But there is some that extends out into the infrared, those stoplight fish I talked about. It, it is in the red, but it extends out into the infrared. And there are some down in the ultraviolet um, that ex they start in the blue, but they extend down into the ultraviolet. We have no idea what that's about. And actually, we know of a deep sea shrimp um, that can see ultraviolet light. 
And so, you know, there may be a connection there, but we still don't know what it is. Yeah. Well, um, so deep sea fish have a biology that's designed to be under a lot of pressure, and earlier in the, your presentation, you handled two of them. Were they collected at a depth that just didn't decompress them enough? And if you were to collect deep sea fish and try to bring them up alive, how would you avoid decompressing them? So actually, um, it's a common misconception that, that they can't handle the, the pressure change. Most of, or an awful lot of these animals don't have air-filled spaces in their bodies. And so uh, if you bring them up slowly, um, that you can bring them up alive if you bring them up cold. What kills them more often than not is the change in temperature, because it's so cold in the deep sea, you bring them through surface waters, they're killed alive. So those fish that you saw me working with were captured in devices that sealed them at temperature, not at pressure, but at the temperature they were at depth. And then we bring them directly into a cold room on the ship, and we keep them cold the whole time. Now, if you take one of those deep sea fish and you try to keep it alive, then the pressure differential starts having an effect over a longer period of time because their membranes don't function properly at the lower pressures, and so they will die o over a period of a day or two. Do you know if the male or female is more aggressive? In what, squid? Yeah. Not a clue. <laughs> Do you know what the purpose of the dinoflagellates emitting light is? Ah, that's a really good question, and it's actually something I care a lot about. She was asking what the purpose of dinoflagellates, those single cells. So actually, the, the tr predominant theory is that it's used as a bioluminescent burglar alarm. And there's actually good uh, laboratory evidence to show that um, uh, fish feeding on biolumin on, um, well, if you've got like small shrimp feeding on the bioluminescent dinoflagellates, they make themselves visible to fish that then feed on them. And so it, it does function as a burglar alarm. But I've always had a problem with that um, for a bunch of reasons. And I've done some experiments recently, and I just got a paper published about this. And um, there's another type of dinoflagellate than the ones I showed you that have a much dimmer type of lum luminescence, and I don't think it functions as a burglar alarm, and I think it may have been the original purpose of bioluminescence in dinoflagellates in that um, it's a warning to say, don't eat me or you'll be sorry, because it, it's associated with toxic dinoflagellates. And so um, the, the flash is a warning, and then it eventually evolved into a brighter flash that could be used as a burglar alarm. Is there a difference in the number of bioluminescent organisms or in the color of the bioluminescence depending on the temperature of the water? Oh, um, there's, that's a good question. Uh, it's a little hard to answer because uh, one of the things that happens in the open ocean environment because of this problem of no trees or bushes to hide behind is that most of the animals in the open ocean go through vertical migration. So they hide down in the dark depths during the day, and they only come up to feed in food-rich surface waters under cover of darkness. So they, they can uh, withstand some remarkable temperature changes. There is this amazing squid that uses bioluminescence as a type of camouflage um, on its belly. It ima exactly matches the color of downwelling sunlight. And um, if the cloud goes over the sun, it dims, the sun uh, dims its bioluminescence. So it's a perfect cloaking device. But the amazing thing is that down deep, it produces a narrow blue spectrum that exactly matches the spectrum of light down deep. And if it comes up to the surface under moonlight, the spectrum is broader and greener, and it turns on another set of photophores, and it, it changes its color. And you can control that with temperature. If you take that squid and you put it in cold water, you can get it to emit blue light. You put it in warmer lot water, it emit, emits blue-green. Yes, Anne. Oh, yeah, actually, just because you live in the, uh, so far away from the ocean doesn't mean you can't be doing things to help. Actually, one of the most important things you can do 
is um, uh, eat vegetarian. And I, I, I don't claim to be a vegetarian. I aspire to be a vegetarian. But that's enough. You know, if you just ate vegetarian one day a week, you'd be surprised at what a difference it would make for the ocean. And, and don't drink bottled water. You know, just carry your own. Tap water is fine. <laughs> Those two things would make a huge difference in and of themselves. You could make a big difference. This is one back there. I can't comfortably say that, um, but I do believe it. Because um, what's happening right now is that with this press of population, 7 billion people on the planet growing to 9 billion, we are having such an impact on our life support systems. And we are an ocean-based planet. And we're going to need people that know how to sustain those life support systems. So I do tell students that want to go into marine biology that it's very important not to just take marine biology classes. You need a subspecialty. You know, go into molecular biology, uh, chemistry, physics. And, you know, there's all different ways that you can become involved in, in marine biology. But if you do that, then I think you're pretty well assured of being able to find um, uh, a, a good career. And, you know, one of the great things about exploration is, th is that sense of knowing, learning something that no one's ever known in the history of the world. And it doesn't have to be that you're down in a submersible or, or doing that kind of thing. I've had the same thrill, I mean literally the same thrill, from discovering something that nobody's ever known before. You can do it in a laboratory, but I still think it's the best feeling in the world. It, it, and you know, being an explorer is, is awesome. And we can all be explorers. We all are explorers when we're first born. From the first time a baby crawls away from the safety of its mother's arms and wants to look around the corner to see what's there, we're explorers. And somehow it gets beaten out of us. But it's, it's, a, it's an innate part of our humanness, and it's one of the great things in our, our, our humanity um, that we need to encourage. Um, I think we're going to. Thank you. Thank you. That was a, a wonderful conclusion to this program. I know there are more questions. There will be a few minutes to interact afterwards more informally. We have the, um, the book sales going on in the lobby. There's another event here at 7, and that's one reason we need to, to move on along. I forgot to put in a small plug for the creator of the award itself, which we give, which is our local sculptor, Vern Schaefer, who is being honored uh, in the community. And to the, the artist, Don Reed, who casts the award for us every year. And so I'm sure you'd be welcome to come up and browse and get a closer look at that as well. Thank you for coming. Stay in touch with the Roy Chapman Andrews Society. Let us know if you want to be part of our friendship group through email, and we'll keep you posted on our events. Thank you. <laughs>